Every time I watch this trilogy of apes movies, I'm reminded as to why I developed a passion for movies. You're not just watching a few hours of CGI nonsense swinging about the screen, you're seeing the results of groundbreaking work from very talented people who came together and sweated their nuts off to give us, the audience, hours of immersive entertainment. And this trilogy of apes movies are far more immersive to me than other comparable movies. These are stories worth revisiting if you haven't watched them in a while. So to help us appreciate them one more time, here I am to give you a solid recap of all three movies, taking as much time as we need to appreciate the amazing work in production, and also to pick out some things that could have been better. Oh no! We start with Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Easily the best movie in the trilogy, with Caesar having a stronger story, the main human character having a good amount of depth, and the movie as a whole just feels more neatly constructed, with most of the characters and events feeling purposeful. James Franco plays our main human character, a lead scientist researching a potential cure for Alzheimer's disease, testing on apes in case they encounter any horrible side effects. Morally questionable of course, but the apes get free grapes and a toy to play with. I don't think they get free grapes and a toy to play with in the jungle, do they? Sure, their family and friends are there, but pff, who needs them? James Franco has a personal level of urgency to find a cure for Alzheimer's, as his father has it and is rapidly deteriorating, and you get a good reminder of how scary this disease is. Not understanding where you are, not understanding that you can't do certain things, and essentially believing yourself to be in a different time of your life. It's not really something I'd seen portrayed in the movie before this, and it moved me. It also helps that he's played by John Lithgow, a man who lives in my nostalgic heart for being in this movie I loved as a kid called Harry and the Hendersons. I don't think you'll ever know how much you've meant to us. <laughs> ah, who am I kidding? I still love this movie now. The first test chimpanzees show signs of the experimental drug working, so James Franco hosts an emergency meeting to get the drug further funding from investors. While this meeting's happening, the same chimp starts acting hostile towards the keepers, and the keepers don't understand what the matter is, having already given her the grapes and toys and such. You ungrateful bitch. She breaks out and starts smashing up the joint, and they shoot her dead right in front of the investors. Oh no! Franklin, the chimp handler, discovers that she wasn't being aggressive, she was being protective of her newborn son. So James Franco agrees to take Baby Ape home to protect him. Immediately, John Lithgow calls him Caesar, which is the perfect name for the future New World leader. If this was my pet chimp, the New World leader of the ape race would have been called something like Peanut Butter, because I'm a pathetic millennial who names their pets with the primary goal of making me look original and funny, rather than giving my pet a name to match their character we do anything you say, Mr. Banana Pants. Caesar inherited the boosted brain juice from his mother, and his intelligence rapidly evolves, far exceeding the brain age of human kids the same age. So Franco remains optimistic that the cure will work, he just needs more time, but he's reminded of how little time he has left, with his father now going bananas over a table lamp. So he steals some of the drug samples from the lab called ALZ-112, and injects his dad in one last desperate move to save him. When the morning arrives, James wakes up to to see his dad has regained his ability to play the piano. I love my lamp, give me back my lamp. Which you would think as a son would bring you to your knees in tears. Not only have you cured Alzheimer's, validating all your hard work, but now your dad won't try sticking his penis in the toaster anymore. He's cured. I will. I'm not sick anymore. There's nothing there. In all seriousness, his lack of crying does take me out of the movie a little bit. I sometimes feel like these Hollywood blockbusters are afraid of showing our lead men crying. Because oh no, we can't have them being pussies, can we? Crying is for babies and women. While James is reservedly celebrating and documenting this success, Caesar ventures outside to play with the children and gets shooed away by a man with a baseball bat. Enough! Enough! It doesn't matter with you! 
What the hell the matter is, is this chimpanzee has the strength to rip my kid's limbs apart like tissue paper. So maybe that's why I'm panicking slightly. Caesar gets hurt in this conflict, so they take him to the zoo to get stitched up. And it's here we meet James Franco's soon-to-be love interest. It takes less than one minute of screen time before James makes his move and asks her out to dinner. And it takes just one chimp doing sign language for her to accept. Okay, what's she saying now? Time starts moving even quicker now as we get a montage of Caesar exploring the woods so he can climb trees and return back to his natural habitat for a while. Still without his family or friends, but to substitute, he has a hot step mum who James is now in love with. This montage makes the relationship development feel way too fast, but it was necessary and a benefit to skip some of the growing time for Caesar, as we need to get to the next stage of this character's development, where he questions his place in the world. And the conversation for this is generated naturally by this scene. Come on. Are you a pet? No. I'm your father. As Caesar isn't a moron, he requires a little more explanation. So James takes him to the place where it all happened and explains how Caesar doesn't have any ape family because science killed them all. This next scene I feel strongly communicates Caesar's internal struggles, shows that he no longer wants to be dependent on the family like he's a pet. But when he sees John Lithgow using the fork wrong, he immediately shows concern while helping him to correct the mistake. This range of emotions is perfect because it's important to show that Caesar still loves his adopted family while at the same time feeling like he doesn't belong here. This scene contains very little dialogue, allowing the audience to imagine what they're saying internally. And I appreciate movies that show this kind of restraint. Now, if only James Franco showed as much emotion as Caesar does here, instead of seeming slightly bored by what just happened. As we just saw, John Lithgow's disease is returning with a vengeance, indicating that the drug is ultimately a fail. We continue to watch John struggle as he gets into the wrong person's car, forgetting that he doesn't even drive anymore. And what terrible luck. This car belongs to the same guy who sees a scared earlier. But in this case, I see this guy is way more of an asshole. Answer the goddamn question. What were you doing? I have a car just up here. You know, well, it's done. Obviously. I'm done. I'm done. The police can handle it. It's fairly obvious the old man is confused and scared. And yes, granted, it is annoying that you'll be late for work now. But why would you be this aggressive towards a vulnerable person who clearly just made a mistake? Caesar, like the hero he is, jumps in and beats the crap out of him, momentarily losing his human influence as he returns to Monk by biting his finger. <laughs> <laughs> Caesar looks terrified here as he knows he's been bad and he basically turns into a scared child as he's casted away to the animal shelter. This is a typical behaviour pattern for most teenagers. First comes the identity crisis, then rebellion, then you experience the consequences for your actions in your rebellion and then you cry to mum and dad. No. In the animal shelter, we meet the movie's villain played by Tom Felton, but let's just call him Malfoy because I have no imagination. Malfoy treats all the apes like crap, but focuses his spitefulness on Caesar just to bring him down a peg or two and make him realise he's not a special ape. You can't have any of your prisoners believing they have power. They must know their place. The other apes also realise Caesar is different and therefore is treated as an outcast. Rocket, the current lead ape, makes an example of him by ripping off his special red shirt in an act of dominance. By the time James and his girlfriend come to visit, Caesar is desperate to get out of this place and your heart breaks seeing the anxiety in Caesar's expressions. And this is a good point to talk about the marvellous performance from Andy Serkis in this movie. Andy Serkis is unlike any other actor. He can inhabit characters that don't speak and emote in ways that you don't really see often in movies. The basic usage of performance capture is to see it on the screen, you will see the apes, but they're apes which are infused with the heart and soul of an actor's performance. At no point did I ever feel like I was watching a CGI ape. I felt like I was watching a character. 
the facial expressions we see here, the way he walks and interacts with people. This isn't just CGI magic. This is only possible by having a great actor transforming himself into a believable ape protagonist. And Andy was already experienced in ape-like behavior from his work on the 2005 version of King Kong. In an interview, he explains how he spent a lot of time with apes and even went to Rwanda to study the mountain gorillas. All of this dedication is super impressive to me. And if knowing this doesn't inspire you to work harder on your passions, I don't know what will. Malfoy and his buddies decide to party in the ape prison, which is kind of weird, but whatever. Caesar spots an opportunity to take advantage of one of Malfoy's dumb friends and steals his bottle opener knife combo tool. This allows him the freedom to wander in and out of the cages to formulate an escape plan. First things first, however, he needs to become the dominant ape, using his brain instead of his brawn like Rocket to make the biggest, toughest ape his friend and convincing the rest to fall in line will be a piece of cake. Maurice the orangutan, who also knows sign language, reminds Caesar that his army of apes are still just dumb apes in comparison to him. So that night, Caesar breaks out and goes home to collect some capsules of the experimental drug. Now at this point, you may be wondering why Caesar doesn't just stay out now that he's escaped. But you need to realize that Caesar isn't just trying to escape this prison. He's also looking to establish a new family. He wants a new race of smart apes to feel like he belongs to a group. So with this smart drug in hand, Caesar begins dishing out intelligence to his new friends. While the apes start communicating with heightened intelligence, let's see what's happening at Genesis, because we have a very important character to introduce, Cobra. Cobra is a veteran test subject, which makes him compliant with more procedures. Since James told his boss about his father's temporary improvements, they greenlit funding to continue research for the ALZ drug, which is now on its 13th version. Cobra's here to take the doses, but on the first test, it causes a violent reaction as he rips off Franklin's gas mask. <laughs> Got it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. When Franklin then falls ill, it neatly foreshadows the events that tie into the next movie. Emergency rooms are being overwhelmed with patients showing signs of what's being dubbed the simian flu. Before we go on to the ape escape chapter of this story, we take a moment to say farewell to John Lithgow's character. In a touching moment, John reaches out to tell James to stop giving him the drug, bravely accepting that this is his time to go. James spends the whole night with him and wakes up to find John has peacefully passed away. And this would be an appropriate key moment to cry. No? No, no tears, James? Okay, cut. Caesar baits Malfoy and his electric wand out to fight. And this moment right here still gives me a rush. Take your stinking bar off me, you damn 38! No! I love that none of the trailers gave away this spoiler, so that when we saw this in the cinema for the first time, we were just as shocked as Malfoy was. And I wish I could relive that moment again. No! 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 As Caesar breaks his fellow apes out of the cages, they jump the nicer zookeeper. And it was really cool to see Caesar defend him, demonstrating that he still views some humans as good. Which isn't the case for this human, he's still being a piece of shit. So Caesar electrocutes him. The ape gang proceed to break out the test chimps from Genesis, including our raggedy new friend Cobra. And I really enjoy watching these apes run havoc across San Francisco, even if some of it seems a bit dumb and unrealistic. I can overlook this silliness because the Golden Gate Bridge scene is as memorable as it is technologically impressive. After watching the behind the scenes footage, you realize what a massive task it was to motion capture all of these actors because not only had motion capture never been possible outside before, but they also had to factor in that these people needed to be edited out. A difficult task when you can see how many actors they have running across the set. And it's not just a case of cutting out the actors' bodies. They have to consider things like reflections on windows and mirrors. 
There are certain parts of these movie stories that I'm deliberately leaving out. Like all my reviews, I like to keep some things as a surprise for any new people wanting to check them out. So please bear that in mind before angrily commenting about how I left certain details out. Now, my biggest gripe with this movie is the idea that these chimps would stand any sort of chance against the US military. They managed to outsmart the police and that's fine and all, but the government now knows all of these apes are located in the same forest. Why wouldn't they just scramble some jets to bomb the crap out of these woods? I understand that the redwoods are protected by conservation laws, but when the entire human race is in critical danger, I would like to think that this law would be temporarily put on hold so they can deal with the problem. Anyway, to close this first movie off, we see the start of the conflicting personalities within the ape group when Cobra goes to attack James. Cobar being an ape that's only ever known humans to be captors is obviously a stark contrast from Caesar's experience, and this little moment right here is a great way to foreshadow the conflicts to come. Lastly, we get a sweet moment where Caesar reveals to James that he can speak for himself now. Caesar is home. And they all climb the trees in victory at the end. Yeah, this one falls more into the category of guilty pleasure. And that's not to say there aren't elements I think are legitimately good, because there are still tons of things to appreciate. But the change in director and the addition of one more writer gives obvious differences when you compare them to the previous movies. We now have Matt Reeves directing, who previous to this directed Cloverfield, a movie I actually quite like, but many people hate it. And to be fair, I can understand why. <laughs> Other than this, the only movie he had directed was Let Me In, a lesser quality remake of a Swedish film called Let The Right One In. And I say lesser quality based on the reviews I've seen, I've not actually checked it out for myself. So at that point in time, they really took a gamble giving Matt Reeves the reins to this movie. Granted, for the first movie, they also took a gamble with Rupert Wyatt. But based on the success of Rise, why wouldn't you keep him on board to direct the sequels? This got me curious, so I looked up the reason why, and apparently it's because his vision for the sequel didn't lie up with Fox's sensibilities. Now, unless Rupert suggested that Caesar becomes a crack whore giving blowjobs to lonely truck drivers, I really can't see what would have been so offensive about his ideas. But whatever, we have a Matt Reeves movie now. Our first look at Caesar shows an entirely new character. His intense expression, slightly bloodshot eyes and blood red war paint shows this guy has been through some shit in the last year, or however long it's been between movies. But he remains strong as the ape's commanding leader. And again, we're given the freedom to use our imagination as to what went down with Caesar in that time period, because the intro to the movie focused on events on a global scale. There's no sign of James Franco or his girlfriend, so we're left wondering if this war face on Caesar is masking the pain of loss. Caesar and the gang are out hunting deer when all of a sudden his son gets attacked by a bear. Oh yeah, he has a wife, Cornelia, and a son called Blue Eyes, so I guess it has to have been a few years at least. Cobra ends up saving them both, and Blue Eyes resents his father for giving him a lecture while he's feeling the fresh sting of bear claw wounds. How do I reach these? Blue Eyes and his friend Ash go for a walk, and they stumble into this asshole guy, who out of panic shoots Ash. <laughs> I know he doesn't seem like an asshole right now, but give it time. So ape gang rush in and the humans try to surrender, but then Caesar says, Go! I like how this surprise encounter comes as a shock to the humans and also the apes. The humans have most likely not come into direct contact with the apes, given their surprise of the apes' ability to talk. And Caesar's mouth agape like this indicates a state of alarm, having to quickly come up with a plan on how to deal with the situation. On first watch, I was surprised to see the apes have chosen to remain here in the Redwoods. I would have thought at this point in time, they would have been driven out by the military or simply left by choice to increase their chances of survival. As it seems like the virus has wiped out a good chunk of Earth's population, I can understand the military resource being fizzled out. But still, it only takes one plane and a few bombs to deal with this problem. So why does it appear like they've not even tried? Anyway, arsehole guy and his fellow humans run back home and report to their leader, Gary Oldman, the best and most underused actor in this whole movie. Look! I know why you're 
scared. I'm scared too. And in this dialogue, we get exposition to explain to us why they went to the forest. It was to survey the dam, which they need to repair in order to restore power to the camp. I quite like the structure of this exposition. If we had known this information earlier, we wouldn't have been able to experience the same confusion as the apes did as to what the humans' intentions were. I remember when I first watched this, I assumed the humans were simply there to hunt. The apes gather around to discuss a plan of action, and we see the beginning of this group's destabilisation, with Cobra wanting to fight and guilt tripping Ash's father who is still loyal to Caesar, and Caesar trying desperately to keep the peace. And with Caesar's reasoning, they call off the meeting to make a final decision in the morning. I like this one-on-one -on -one discussion afterwards, where Cobra calmly explains that he is on Caesar's side, but he knows more about what humans are capable of, and the apes must demonstrate their strength to prevent this from happening again. The joining of their hands is powerful imagery, and I like at this point in the movie, you agree equally with both sides of the argument. Cobra isn't just some cartoonish villain, he's a reasonable ape. Morning arrives and they decide to confront the humans so that Caesar can lay down some ground rules. Apes! Do not want war! Ape! Hold! Schumann! So, do not come back. And despite them looking a little silly on horseback, it didn't distract from how intimidating this scene is. For bonus points, I love how deranged Cobra looks here. I'd sooner pick a fight with Tyson Fury than have to go toe to toe with this crazy bastard. Gary Oldman restores calm to this panicked community and delivers a decent speech, reminding them all that they've been through hell together, so they can get through this too. So that we can start to, to rebuild and reclaim the world we love. Honestly, I wish Gary Oldman was the lead human character and not whoever this guy is, who despite giving some emotional moments, his story just doesn't resonate with me the same way Gary Oldman's does. And we're given way more time with this guy's character than Gary Oldman. There's one scene later with Gary that perfectly demonstrates this quality over quantity of screen time. This guy, played by Jason Clark, insists that he has to go back and strike a deal with the apes to let them repair the dam, risking his life by breaking the rules set by Caesar. The apes go ape shit at the insult of him returning. I need to show you something. It's not far. Human lies! No! No! <laughs> but luckily for him, he convinces Caesar to allow him to show him why the dam is so crucial to the humans. Caesar agrees on the condition that they surrender their guns to be destroyed, which they agree to. Cobra isn't too happy with this deal, because when he thinks of allowing humans to do their work, he reminds us... Human work. Human Work. Cobra once again concedes Caesar's authority, but sneaks off to do some recon on the humans. And he was right to do so, because it turns out the humans have a lot more guns stashed away, confirming Cobra's established distrust in the humans. I really like this moment where Cobra plays dumb when he's caught snooping around. You lost? Trying to get home? Not only does it serve as a nice moment of levity for the grim tone of this movie, but this gives his character a layer of increased intelligence, which only makes you respect him more. Get out of here, stupid monkey! Oh, you heard it, go! Shortly after work begins on the dam, the humans set off an explosion to clear rubble or whatever, and arsehole guy gets trapped inside. Rocket, the father of Ash, who arsehole guy shot earlier, helps clear the rubble, showing an amazing level of cooperation. I was going to say a level of forgiveness, but this face right here doesn't quite give off the vibes that he forgives what happened, but instead he can temporarily let it slide to help out. As a-hole guy recovers outside, Caesar's newborn son, who I forgot to mention, goes to play with the humans, and because a-hole is as rotten as the hole in your ray, he decided to bring a gun along, and threatens the apes when they discover it. Hey! Oh, I'll kill you! <laughs> Said no guns. <laughs> 
After being ordered to leave again, Jason decides, no, I'm going back to Caesar. All we did was shoot a kid, break their rule of not coming back, and then break another rule by bringing a gun. Caesar's being unreasonable. I love Caesar's expression here. Like, is this dude seriously up in my joint again? This lady, Ellie, not that anyone's name matters, notices that Cornelia is sick and has some antibiotics in her backpack. So Caesar allows one more day in exchange for this medicine. And I kid you not, this cheeky bastard right here has the audacity to ask for more time. I need a little more time. Wednesday! Yeah, I'd be on this level of cheesed off too. Blue Eyes knows what's up. And as much as I like Caesar, his son's disobedience here does make sense. Things are about to get worse for Caesar, as Cobra has returned home to find Caesar and some of the more loyal apes helping the humans now. Humans, attack your sons. You let them stay, put apes in danger. And this is my favourite dialogue exchange in the whole movie, because again, you can't help but feel Cobra is right in some way. Caesar love humans more than apes more than your sons at the end of the fight you feel kind of bad for cobra he seems genuinely disheartened that he wasn't listened to and has now been beaten down in front of the other apes but this charitable feeling of pity won't last very long however so that evening the humans finish their work and they see lights come on for the first time in many years the people in the camp celebrate gary oldman gets to power up his tablet and gets to see a picture of his kids This moment is why Gary Oldman needed to be the main character. So everyone's happy now. Apes and humans have demonstrated collaboration, so maybe they can live alongside each other in peace. Oh, no, here comes Cobra to shoot Caesar and then trick the other apes into believing it was the humans. I love the antagonised upset that can be heard in Blue Eyes' voice here. I still love the first movie way more, but this sequence of events from Cobra returning home to Cobra's betrayal is excellent. This is an S-tier sequence of events. So the apes charge into the camp with Cobra willing to sacrifice the lives of many to fight his cause, which at this point it's now obvious he no longer cares about the ape family and has just gone off the rails with anger. The other apes become aware of his lunacy when he kills Ash for disobeying his orders. Apes, follow Cobra. No. I would normally be screaming at the screen right now for them to kill Cobra, as they all have guns and he doesn't. But then I remembered that Caesar had the rule, ape, no kill ape. And I believe that rule is still ingrained in their code of ethics. Speaking of Caesar, he's been found alive by the humans, which came as no surprise to anyone watching. I hope. And he asks the humans to hide him out in James Franco's old house while he recovers. Jason Clark goes off to get medicine and Blue Eyes happens to bump into him. So Jason shares the good news. Your father. He's alive. Blue Eyes and Caesar share some heartfelt forgiveness exchanges, which in my opinion drags on for a little bit too long. With Caesar almost recovered, he wanders around the old house and he finds a camcorder containing footage of James Franco and baby Caesar bonding. I would have liked this touching scene to be at the end of the movie personally. Maybe after he's won the battle and is all exhausted, he comes back home temporarily before leaving for good, has a sit down and reflects on his life so far. That way we could have ended the movie with a closing off a chapter kind of feel. Caesar eventually gets the Cobra atop his tower and they clash in a fight scene that honestly I found a bit underwhelming, especially with how Cobra dies. I feel like an ape would have survived his fall, maybe. I know he was injured, but he still had some things to kick off from and grab onto. So seeing this made it feel like the death scene didn't have much punch to it. It didn't feel final enough. There was no blood or beheading. Maybe they could have had blue eyes step in from the shadows and shoot him, considering he watched Cobra murder his best friend earlier. I'm rushing through the ending of this one because it's my least favourite part of the movie. It's nothing offensively bad. I would consider it an average way to end the movie. 
I also wasn't too pleased with the way Gary Oldman sacrifices himself by blowing up the tower with him under it. The movie almost made it seem like him doing this was a bad thing here, when he's totally justified. If only we had spent more time with Gary Oldman, this sacrifice of his would have been way more impactful. Anyway, Caesar and Jason say farewell at the end of the battle, knowing that this war between apes and humans will carry on regardless of their friendship, now that news of this battle has spread to other camps. And the story of this war continues on in... War for the Planet of the Apes picks up shortly after Dawn ended. A battalion of troops has been dispatched to capture Caesar, and among these troops, I was surprised to see some of Cobra's old loyalist apes helping. This is some good continuity, as it provides a good variety of relationships between apes and humans for this story. Despite the apes' help, the humans fail miserably with their task, and when defeated, Caesar's apes bring them in for a good old-fashioned telling off. I do not start this war. The ape who did is dead. Here, they introduce Winter, the albino gorilla, who I think looks awesome, and I wish he played a more noble character in this, but he ends up being a turncoat too. Ultimately, Caesar lets the humans go, as a sign of mercy, to show that the good apes do not want this war. But the colonel in charge of this operation doesn't care, and sends more troops at night to sneak in and kill him. <laughs> Caesar overhears the colonel on the walkie saying that he's killed who he thinks is Caesar. So Caesar charges ahead to find out who he's actually killed. And let me tell you now, this emotion we're about to see is easily my favourite reaction in the entire trilogy. He killed his family. I just, this is awful. And yet somehow awesome. In the previous film, we were back and forth between supporting Caesar and supporting the villain. But now we just straight up want Caesar to rip this guy apart. Also, can we take a moment just to appreciate how amazing this set looks? I can't tell how much of this set is actually here and how much of it is green screen or added as CGI. But regardless, this is my favourite looking place in the entire trilogy too. And the reveal of Woody Harrelson is perfect. You immediately hate this guy for what he's just done. He's a cold killer to be feared. Caesar attempts to climb up to him, spitting with animalistic rage, but Woody cuts the rope and down he goes. This next scene hits hard too. When Caesar returns to Maun, he realises that his youngest son Cornelius is still alive, and this scene is complemented by Michael Giacchino's simple yet moving score. I'm a big Michael Giacchino fan, and have been since hearing Operation Market Garden for Medal of Honor. It's beautiful, it's kind of unsettling in parts, but oddly enough, it fills me with a weird sense of mournfulness for a battle I wasn't even alive to be affected by. Anyway, back to the story. Caesar tells everyone to evacuate, as he has unfinished business with the colonel. But because this is a movie, we get the cliche of, no, I'm coming with you, despite the fact that you told us you want to go alone, because you're my b, -b brother and we're sticking by you. So, Rocket, Maurice and Luca, I think this one's Luca, set off on their journey, with their first port of call being to check out this nearby hut, where some of the ape guards had reported seeing humans. When they get to the camp, the human freaks out and goes for his gun, but Caesar pulls a sneaky from the shadows with his own gun, and it turns out this was the father of a mute girl, or possibly he was just her carer, based on how little she reacts to his death. What makes this moment all the more infuriating is that later on she cries over the death of an ape that she's known for five minutes. 
Maurice pleads with Caesar that she needs to come with the apes, otherwise she will die. And it's clear that Caesar's done with being nice to humans at this point, and well, who can blame him? But Maurice reminds Caesar that the producers at Fox have insisted on including a cute kid, because their research shows that audiences respond well to cute kids, and if she doesn't come along, they're going to pull funding. When they reach the next base to inspect, Caesar assesses the situation from afar with some binoculars. Now, watch this and see if you can see anything wrong here. <laughs> no. Winter. How the hell did Caesar know what question was being signed when he wasn't even looking at them? They confront Winter and demand that he reveals what he knows, and Winter explains that he had to tell the humans where Caesar was, otherwise they would kill him. So basically, what Winter's saying here is that he's responsible for the death of Caesar's wife and child. As he realises this, the look of horror on Winter's face is perfect, and he goes to shout out knowing he's about to be murdered. <laughs> This part just highlighted a massive bugbear for me when it comes to inept guards in movies. Why would the guards come this close to the tent after hearing this commotion, but then go, nah, it'll be too much time to look inside the tent. We've assessed the situation just from approaching the tent. Let's not waste two seconds of our precious time and go back to idly wandering around. Oh, so annoying. Speaking of annoying, the next character they bump into on their journey is Bad Ape. Bad Ape. Ape. And Caesar was going to leave him behind, but Bad Ape reminds him that the producers at Fox insist this movie has a comic relief character. Studies show that the topic of war is too depressing, and audiences respond well with the movie. Nah, but for real, the reason he tags along is he knows where the quarantine facility is, and that's where the colonel's based. My jokes about the producer's influence comes from a real feeling that this movie in the trilogy especially feels more like a board member's project rather than a director's vision at times. They went in a bit too hard with Bad Ape being a goofball. I'm okay. And this little girl was clearly just put into the movie so we can have this big emotional scene when she cries over the death of whoever this ape is. Ah, screw it, why am I blurring him out? It's Luca, who got stabbed when they were jumped by some patrolling guards. You see, in the two minutes where Luca and the girl interacted, Luca gave her a flower, and this is much more meaningful than anything her father ever gave her, like food, clothes, and a roof over her head. I cry instead for Luca, an ape I spent so little time with, I probably didn't even learn his name. With Luca's death, Caesar now sees it as a mistake for allowing them to come with him on his journey, as it was supposed to be just about his personal vendetta with the colonel. So he sets off on his own for real this time. Arriving at the facility, he looks down in horror at the sight of so many apes living as prisoners. Distracted by this horror, a guard is able to sneak up and knock him out. <laughs> When he awakes in a daze, he hears Woody talking some nonsense before explaining that he didn't come that night to kill his family. That was simply an oopsie doopsie moment on Woody's side, and he says he's sorry. Caesar gets thrown into jail with the rest of the apes, who are so done with life that they don't even recognise him as a leader anymore. The next day, the apes are put to work moving stones to build a wall. Caesar notices the humans are preparing to defend themselves, which is very strange right now, as we've interpreted this war to just be between apes and humans, and these projectiles aren't even aimed towards where the apes are. Hmm, interesting. One of the apes causes an accident, and a traitor ape named Donkey is ordered to give lashings as a punishment. <laughs> Caesar makes his protest known. Caesar! And the other apes feel a sudden rush of togetherness, something of which could be very dangerous for Woody, so he needs to shut this down quickly. And he does so in a very brutal way when Caesar makes demands for change. Four. Three. Two. 
I love how prepared for death Caesar looks here. It's terrible knowing what he's been through as a character. And this movie definitely did a good job of making you feel his pain. So the apes get back to work and they stick Caesar up on a crucifix as a warning for any future would-be saviours. Hmm, all of this is looking a little grim. And we don't want to bump this movie's rating up from a 12A. So let's bring Bad Ape into this scene and have him say something totally hilarious and not at all jarringly unfunny. Oh no! Why so small? Caesar gets cut down halfway through the night so that Woody can deliver some exposition to him. I know that sounded like a criticism, but this exposition is a good thing because we learn that the simian flu has mutated in recent years. So the surviving humans who developed immunity are now susceptible to this new strand. The effects of this new strand turned humans into speechless, mindless beasts. But I will criticize the way in which we don't see any humans take any kind of precaution to prevent infection. They're not wearing any protective gear no hazmat suits or face masks, no keeping two meter distances from each other, and maybe that's because the simian flu isn't an airborne contagion, but it does bug me how none of the humans seem to be concerned about catching it. Back to the silly stuff because we need it of course, Bad Ape accidentally discovers a way into the base. They make their way through the tunnels and find a way up into the prison yard, but Bad Ape has a super hilarious bad feeling about this. Oh no! Oh wait, hang on. I, uh, I've, I've got a note from Fox. Dear Hausenberg Films, if you don't laugh at Bad Ape, we will copyright claim the fuck out of your video, you mumbling British piece of shit. Well, that's a bit much, isn't it? I skipped over the part where Mute Girl manages to sneak past the worst guards in the world so that she can feed Caesar some grain and more importantly make the audience go, ah. I mean, to make the audience understand how important she is to the story. Bad Ape, Maurice and Rocket successfully find a way to take out a guard and unlock the cages, and they begin their escape from prison, just in time before Woody's base gets attacked by soldiers. As Woody explained earlier, he faces threats of being shut down by the military because they don't agree with his methods of killing humans to stop the spread of infection. And I've got to say, with the exposition scene we had with Woody, you do understand his rationale. I realized that I would have to sacrifice my only son so that humanity could be saved. I gave the orders to kill the other infected, all of them. Some of the men questioned my judgment. I was asking them to do what I had done, to sacrifice their friends. As the military invade, Caesar hangs back to get his revenge on Woody, only to find that Woody has succumbed to the disease. Caesar has conflicted feelings, knowing that killing him is what Woody wants and would be an act of mercy, but killing him was the way in which Caesar sought revenge. The only logical yet cold choice here is to let Woody do it himself. Which as we can imagine isn't the kind of sweet justice Caesar desired. With the other humans attacking the facility, the apes start sneaking back into the jungle. And this one human decides to focus his fire on the apes instead of the other humans, the ones who are posing the immediate threat. So Caesar runs in to explode the wall which is supporting his turret, but gets taken down by an arrow to his side. Donkey watches down in slow motion, regretting his betrayal to ape kind. So in an act of redemption, he explodes the soldier with a rocket. That'll do, Donkey. That'll do. Along comes an avalanche triggered by the explosions and flattens the facility, essentially wiping out the last humans on Earth, apart from the young girl who doesn't matter. All appears to be gold for the survival of the planet of the apes as they venture into a new haven. But this is where we say goodbye to Caesar as he can't recover from his arrow wound. His longest serving soldier and friend Maurice stays with him as he says his parting words. You are now. 
I don't particularly like the way the camera pans up here just before we get to see the reaction from the other apes. This kind of takes away some emotion for me. It would have been touching to see the other apes bow to him one last time in acknowledgement of who he was. So this feels like kind of a lackluster ending to the trilogy. But overall, I have to say, I enjoyed going on this ride again. I wish the movies had stayed more consistent with the writing and directing quality, but I view this trilogy as a whole story. And as a whole story, I felt like it had a consistent narrative with a main character who I really cared about. If nothing else, I'm glad these movies exist as a point of evolution for motion capture technology and a proud achievement of acting for Andy Serkis. And I'm just glad that I had the opportunity to talk about this movie trilogy with my basement buddies, some of whom hang around in the VIP Patreon jungle. And here they are, monkeying around and gathering bananas to serve their chieftain Hausenberg. They're a good bunch of monkeys who deserve this shout out at the end of the video. And you're a good bunch of monkeys for watching. Thank you and see you soon.